Walloping Web Snappers, it's been 50 years since this series first premiered on television. And coincidentally, there's also a new Spider-Man movie coming out this summer. So, uh, yeah, let's review the series. This is Spider-Man, the 60s series. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web, any size, catches seeds, just like flies. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. Is he strong? Listen, bud. He's got radioactive blood. Can he swing from a thread? Take a look overhead. Hey there, there goes a Spider-Man. is his reward to him. Life is a great big bang-up. Wherever there's a hang-up, you'll find a Spider-Man. Now, before I get into this review, this is pretty much the animated equivalent of the Adam West Batman series. The Adam West Batman series is live action, while this is a cartoon, but both of them are just as equally bizarre. At first they start off by adapting comic book material, but then they start getting more and more ridiculous as it goes. So that's just a disclaimer that the series kind of just deviates from the comic book canon and material starting around season two-ish. But with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into this review. The story of Spider-Man, the 60s series, I will go with that, is a bit weird. It starts off by, like I said before, adapting comic book material that has already been established and written, such as Amazing Fantasy number 15 and various other comic book arcs and comic book storylines that were famous in the Steve Ditko, Stan Lee era of Spider-Man comics. They start off by adapting the villains straight from the comic books to the cartoon, but then what's kind of weird is during season two and three, they start making their own original villains that aren't really suited for the webhead himself, but more so for other heroes. And some of the villains that they do come up with are either repeats of other villains that they created or ripoffs of villains that are already in the comic books themselves such as Craven the Hunter as a prime example of the blatant ripoff. And when they do come up with their own villains, it's usually historical baddies from the past or racial stereotypes of villains, such as a, a my mystical Japanese wizard. Just weird stuff like that that doesn't exactly suit Spider-Man at all and would be better suited for other Marvel characters, such as Thor, Hulk, Doctor Strange, and maybe even the Guardians of the Galaxy. While sci-fi does play a role in Spider-Man's mythos, it doesn't play a role to the point where there are aliens. That's more like the Avengers problem. But when they get it right, they get it right. Uh, such as when they adapted the full Amazing Fantasy number 15, and they didn't exactly pull any punches. Sure, it's kind of cheesy at the very beginning. Sure, the animation is not aged well at all, but it's a very faithful adaption to the very first comic book in Spider-Man's mythos, and I applaud the animation team for that. Well, as you know, the main character is of course Spider-Man, because that's what the show's named after, and his alter ego Peter Parker, but outside of that, his supporting cast is kind of, well, not exactly represented at its full potential like it is in other Spider-Man animated series. Um, such as in the first season, whenever he's getting jobs from Mr. Jameson at the Daily Bugle, it seems like him, Betty Brant, and Jameson are the only people inside of the Daily Bugle. Speaking of which, those two have a sort of low-key romance blooming. Sort of. They really care for each other. 
and that I guess <laughs> Jameson is such a skinflint to the point that he can't hire other than empl employees except for a receptionist and one photographer, and he writes a story himself. I guess, I guess that's just it. Budget cuts, right? Not to mention that Aunt May isn't exactly in this series as much either. She's only in probably a few episodes. Captain Stacy is only in a few episodes as well, but that's not until season two or three. Gwen Stacy is not in the show at all. Mary Jane is in one episode. And the villains, yes, Spider-Man's rogues gallery, one of the most acclaimed and diverse rogues gallery in all of comic books, arguably better than Batman's, if not on par with Batman's. Well, the Rose Gallery isn't exactly used to its full extent either, and when they are, the motives to the villains are completely different, uh, such as Green Goblin wanting to, instead of being a crazed whack job out of his mind, maniac, he wants to get magical powers, or the lizard turning into the lizard, which by a freak accident wants to take over the world, or... Okay, well, maybe Mysterio's motive is kind of on par with his <laughs> with his uh, comic book counterpart. And Rhino is too, but Rhino is more of a bodyguard slash hitman that is known within the underrealms of the uh, mafioso world. Also, speaking of Rhino... <laughs> Rhino's faces. <laughs> so all in all, I can't really say that the villains, especially, the villains were not represented to their the full extent like they were in the comics. They were not as fleshed out as they were in the comics. Peter himself isn't exactly fleshed out that well either, because in season one they portray him as this unbeatable, cool superhero that always ends up winning in the end, and he gets the girl in the end. The, the, he's basically portrayed as Mr. Cool, unbeatable guy, superhero, that doesn't exactly have any problems, and never showed the part of Peter Parker that I related to, which is a teenager that is nerdy, alone, and a bully. Someone that doesn't exactly ever get the the winning side of the stick. He always gets the losing side. He always gets the bad end of the stick. And that's the thing that makes Spider-Man so human and relatable to all the readers. And they never really portrayed that in season one. It just showed him really just always winning and always getting his way in the end, some way, somehow, at the end of each episode. And he never really got any bad ends of the stick, which is the reason why Spider-Man is such a popular and relatable character in the first place. They did showcase these traits in season two and three, but I just feel like that was just a massive problem with season one that didn't really show off his characterization to its full potential. Uh, the writing hasn't exactly aged that well. This series is extremely 60s, extremely dated, and a thing of its time. Much like Power Rangers in the 90s, uh, the series does not exactly have timeless dialogue as Spider-Man will make jokes that I'm not even going to get. How is, how is anybody 50 years down the line even supposed to get that? But, like, I get it. They were just trying to make it for entertainment purposes. They are just making it for the children of the time. It's, they were never going to think that 50 years down the line, somebody in 2017, such as myself, was going to go ahead and watch the series and say, oh, yeah, this is... This is definitely gonna be timeless. This is just gonna be. This is gonna be great. You know, just, it that I don't think that ever crossed the producers or the writers or the production staff's mind. Groovy man, groovy. Right, Jameson. Great, just great. A swinger, Jameson is not. I wouldn't have missed this for anything. That does it. I quit. You can't quit unless I say so. That silly girl. 
That's what I said. Silly, silly, silly. Because Betty Brandt left me in this mess, I can't even find my phone book. There shouldn't be any women at all in this world. Just children and men. Give him a break, guys, okay? It, it, it was the 60s. It was a... It was a different time. It was, uh... Um... Okay, I guess there really is no excuse for such behavior like that. It was... It was the 60s! Come on, times have changed! <laughs> Never! Do you hear? Never! Yeah. On second thought, you might be... Right. Besides... I still can't find my phone book. Uh, Miss Brandt. Yeah, I shouldn't have said what I... You know. I understand, Mr. Jameson. Okay, then that's settled. Now, enough of this standing around. Get back to work, both of you. So, I can't say that it is entertaining. It's like not everything that, they, that the characters spout is uh, pop culture references from the 60s or stuff only, you know, people from the 60s would get. I'm just saying that there's a lot of stuff in there that they do make cracks about uh, that hasn't exactly aged well. Take, for example, The Twilight Zone, okay? The Twilight Zone is a 60s television show. That aged like wine. This series aged like, well, an apple. It rotted over time. I still enjoyed it anyways. Okay, I, let's just get the elephant out of the room here. Why does Spider-Man sound like a grown man? Isn't he supposed to be like 17 or something in high school or college? And why does he sound like he could be a man in his late 20s? Robbers, killers, beware. Spider-Man is here. Secondly, if I'm correct, I don't remember if, which one it was. I think it was Canadians. I think it was a Canadian voice cast and an American animation team that did work on this series, or it was the opposite. It was an American voice cast and a Canadian production team. I can't remember which one it was, but a lot of the delivery in this series, voice acting wise, is very awkward, and I, I get it. it, you know, it's like the 60s weren't exactly the best time either for, they weren't the best time for animation or cartoons or anything. Uh, they weren't, they weren't the best time for cartoons. It wasn't until like the 90s for American cartoons that we got a, the, the renaissance. This series doesn't exactly have the best voice acting. Though the series is extremely bizarre at times, and even the animation errors just make me scratch my head and say, wow, the, somebody just said, yeah, it's done. You don't have to redraw it. it. The entertainment value in this series is is massive. Uh, not just for the for someone to pick apart the animation errors and how off a line delivery sounded, but also with the fact that the majority of the, the imagery is very either weird looking or just silly looking. I will say that the second and third season had very atmospheric backgrounds, but at the same time it does not fit Spider-Man at all. Like I said before, it would be better off with somebody like Doctor Strange, Hulk, Thor, and maybe even the Guardians of the Galaxy when it comes to the really spacey episodes of this series but the entertainment value is there just for the fact that the animation errors are just hilariously funny she should be here any time now she'd better have a good story for me it's not every girl who can tie me up like this lucky she doesn't know i'm spider-man but where did she come from how did she get her powers <laughs> took me two hours to get free. <laughs> Soundtrack, all right. 
soundtrack in this series is very jazzy and even has a touch of 60s rock and roll in it for you. This is extremely different from any other Spider-Man soundtrack that I've ever heard, and it's even got that iconic theme song that every Spider-Man fan knows and loves. The 60s soundtrack kind of sounds stockish in the first season, but second and third season they have that pitch of rock and roll that really spices things up. And I really do like the direction that they went with the soundtrack as it does help get through the much longer episodes that the series has to offer. The animation is just really bad. There's just no way to dodge this. It's just it's just bad. I mean there's so many animation errors like I mentioned earlier before and that or they just reused more footage than a uh, Hanna-Barbera cartoon. I know this was the running theme in the 60s animation world, but Come on, guys, put a little bit more effort, or at least if they're not putting more effort, give more effort, um, give more budget to the animation staff, because this series could have been a whole lot better. I mean, look at Spider-Man's character model. Only the webs on his mask and sort of on his torso are detailed while the rest is just blank red. That's not at all accurate to the uh, original costume at all. And the fact that for about four minutes or five, four to five minutes of an episode, one of the longer episodes are like 20-ish 20, 20 minutes, they just have him swinging around and using the same swinging animations over and over while they put the soundtrack to mask the fact that they're just using the swinging animations repeated as filler because they didn't have any more budget. And season three was probably the biggest elephant in the room there because season three, they just repeated stories that they did in season one and two. And not to mention that the last episode was a clip show. It was nothing new. It was just about Spider-Man just sitting down with a kid telling him the dangers of superhero while you tre he treads over adventures that he already had. Now, okay, this is a good concept, but they just, you know, they just slapped some stuff together, did some animation and voice acting, and they just called it a day. That was just, that was the wrap-up for season three, and I just feel like the budget just, the budget was upped a little bit. I'm not talking like movie quality because movie quality animation would have been fantastic, but just up it up a little bit more. We could have had something really good and decent. I'm not really sure what to suggest for the final verdict of this show. I mean, it's bad, but it's also a thing of its time and it's also kind of, weirdly enough, nostalgic. I. I watched this series early in the morning on ABC Family back in the mid-2000s, and I remember watching it and being thoroughly entertained as I was a kid. Um, I guess I'm not going to give this a score. I guess what I'm going to say is that if you're not a Spider-Man fan, you're not going to enjoy this. But if you are a Spider-Man fan, I think that you'll enjoy this as a thing of its time. Something that they made in the 60s to promote the Stan Lee, Steve Ditko era comics. And that you'll enjoy it, and it's very bizarre logic and animation errors. It's pretty enjoyable on its own. So, I'll give this a recommendation if you're a Spider-Man fan. If you're not, you might want to just avoid this. But, that is all. That is, um... Uh, my thoughts of this series, and gotta say, uh, I'm really hoping that the iconic theme song will be featured at the end credits of the new Spider-Man Homecoming movie, like they were in the first two Spider-Man Sam Raimi films. So here's me crossing my fingers. But in the meantime, I'm Lino Morris of the MMCA Productions crew, and I'll see you next time.